Euro Gold is driven by being the best civil engineering contractor in the Northwest, ensuring its clients are given the highest level of service that they deserve. Euro Gold work in a wide range of industry sectors, including house building, highways, commercial and industrial build. Lollavita is an award-winning, independently run Italian restaurant. Located on Rose Lane in the heart of Liverpool, real Italian style dishes, using the best ingredients, skillfully prepared by our chefs. Come and try our serious Italian experience. Mulligan's Funeral and Monumental Services are a family-owned funeral service, first established by the late Brian Mulligan in 1996. We provide funeral homes in Gorton, Manchester and Reddish, Stockport, and we pride ourselves on giving a friendly and professional service to all the families who use our service. Contact us on 0161 432 0809. Hello everyone and welcome to the show. Almost two years ago, Mark Tomlinson, who lived in Birmingham, sadly passed away. Well, we'll be speaking to his mum and dad for the very first time since his sad passing. But first, we're off to meet Ernie Welch at the Old Star Pub in Winsford. You may recall we told you a story about Ernie last year, who was diagnosed with bowel cancer. Well, this week, we're going to find out how Ernie is doing, what success his operation has been, and he's also had a song written about him by his very good friend, Rob Allen. Ernie's been in the recording studio, and the name of the song is, You're Not Gonna Win. As our time together's ending, I look back on all you put me through. Tried your best to make me feel so low. It's been a journey and a half to say the least, and uh, there's been some ups and some downs, but bottom line, I've persevered and, and here I am and everything's good, all good, moving forward positively um, and all clear. I was in theatre then for nine hours, um, they removed about half a metre of bowel and most of my rectum and then fitted me with a stoma bag. Um, I went into um, high dependency for eight days. They sent me to Ward 13, which is a great number, isn't it? Ward 13, you know. And I knew something was wrong when there was a clock on the wall above me and the clock started to move around the room and it was, it was actually sepsis that I'd contacted. And then out of nowhere, and I can see it as clear as day now, this guy, and he was that big that he, he, he came at the end of the bed, leant over, put his, knee, his knuckles down like that, and was right in my face. And I reckon he was well over seven foot tall. He got silver hair flowing locks down here. He got this great big nose and big head on him, a really rugged complexion. And he's like this in my face, and he said, like, come on, Ernie, it's time to go. And I'm going, uh. And he said, come on, you're coming with me now, we're going. And I went, no, no, leave me alone. And then he went, come on, we're going, now, come on. And I, and I remember shouting at him and saying, no, no, go away, leave me alone. You're not going to win. I won't let you be three or four years ago, a new priest, Father Simon, came to St. Joseph's. And um, he wanted to, because 
the social club side of it had been shut down for years and he wanted to, to reinvent it. So through my contacts with the breweries and everything, I helped him to, to get it reopened. And when I was at home, I got many, many visitors. And um, one of them, there was a knock on the door one of the days and my wife went let the, open the door and it was Father Simon, the priest. And he'd come just to see how I was and he'd come in and had a good chat with me. So he, he, he then came in and he blessed me and then he, he gave me Holy Communion. And um, I said, look, for, I haven't been to church for years, Father, you know, I mean, I shouldn't be having this. And he said, you've helped the church out in the past and we're coming to help you now. And he said, I'm here for you. So he came every week and the confidence built up between us. And so I, I shared this moment with him uh, and he said straight away, uh, in his opinion that it was the angel of the Lord coming to take me and I wasn't ready to go and he said he could see that I wasn't ready to go um, and then eventually went away and that is why I've Im I'm improving and everything and everything's good I can only hope your darkness will help them see the light I've done a weekly blog that goes out on the Facebook and goes out on the website and the responses that I've had to that have been absolutely phenomenal from complete strangers whereby it's helped them and they've picked up on stuff and then they've contacted me and I've been writing this blog every Friday since June the 2nd because I always feel like trying to give something back which I've always done we're going to do some fundraising and it's going to be for bowel cancer and it's going to probably be for Leighton Hospital and, and my old favourite, the hospice, you see. So Rob, um, a few weeks ago, <laughs> come in and he says, all right, Ern, I've written you a song, mate. I sent it to him on, um, by text message, uh, and the first one was literally just me playing my guitar and singing over it, and it was only, I think I only had possibly the verse and maybe one chorus, and he went, oh, I like that. So I sat down and wrote a couple more verses to it and then recorded all the backing tracks for it. And then the first attempt at recording we did at Ernie's house, but due to me being an idiot, I did the wrong thing and didn't record it right. So he ended up coming around to my house and we redid all the vocals for him. I've been helping with his IT. I do publish the blog for him as well. So I've seen his stories as they come through. And what's really impressed me is the, just the positive, uh, defiant attitude to this horrible disease and um, so I came up with this title you're not going to win uh, and then sort of wrote a song around it uh, knowing Ernie's love of country music particularly people like uh, Alan Jackson and Jimmy Buffett that kind of thing so I listened to a few of their songs and wrote it in that style for him. We've got it on Spotify, uh, YouTube music, uh, hopefully it'll be on Apple Music soon as well uh, and it was all recorded in my bedroom, <laughs> spare room. <laughs> We're going to try and film a video in here, uh, again in a sort of similar style to the, the country TV that Ernie likes so much. So we'll try and get a bit of a live audience and, and play in front of them and then uh, put it up onto YouTube as well. I, won't let you beat me. I must just ask you to tell me a little story about your granddaughter Annie. What happened to her? Oh, blimey. Annie, she's, um, she's not three till February. On the Sunday she was feeling sick and uh, as the day went on the sickness got worse and she um, started bringing bile up so my daughter Caroline who, who's expecting another baby in the beginning of April whipped her off to Leighton Hospital and um, they did um, an x-ray on her, on Annie amongst other things and then it was straight into an ambulance, blue lights flashing to Alder A Children's Hospital. And, and in a nutshell, what had happened, about three weeks or four weeks ago, Annie was with her little brother, Solomon, and he was building some models and stuff, sat at the table, and Caroline, my daughter, was with them. And the next thing, she's seen Annie with these, the, the, the magnetic ball bearings, coloured ones that the, he uses in his modelling. They've been bought on eBay from China or somewhere. And Annie had got two of them in her mouth and she was trying to separate them because the magnetism is that strong on them that they really have to be tugged apart. So Caroline said, no, 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 don't, you took them off Annie. Uh, don't use them and she's got confiscated them. 
Anyway, when, when, when she's had the x-ray to see about her sickness, they find 20 of these ball bearings in, in, a, in, a, in a system. And they pass through over the three weeks through a digestive system. But because of the magnetism being that strong, as they've gone through the intest small intestine through the bowel, they put 11 perforations in a bowel, right? And um, she had to have a major surgery. And the surgeon said, what he had to do was, he had to cut a piece of bowel away, which was too badly damaged. But because she's young and you've got a long length, it, it, it's, it's not going to affect her long term. But then he individually had to repair all the perforations. And, and he doesn't he think there'll be any, any long term damage. So she's, she's home and she's a lot stronger this morning. She was running around again this morning and she was showing me like, she calls me Pops. She's got the same scar as Pops now, yeah? The difference is she's not three yet, and then, uh, well, I'm in my mid to late 50s, aren't I? Like, you know, but. As Ernie's been such an inspiration to people who read his blog, I know of other people who are either going through similar after being diagnosed, or some people who've just had symptoms who might not have got them checked out, and they've read the blog and said, oh, actually, it's probably worth getting that checked out. Even if it turns out to be nothing, at least they know he's got, got that peace of mind. So he's inspirational in, in many ways, really. There's a team of girls that look after me at Leighton, at the hospital, yeah. and it's called SACO. And it, it's, it's like a daycare unit, and there's a team of 10 of them in total. And every time I go in there every week for checks on magnesium and stuff like that, it's home from home. It's like a hotel. There's a coffee waiting for me. There's this, that, and the other. And they take my bloods and this... Anyway, at Christmas, um, they gave me a, a present and they've had a pint glass engraved, for me especially, and it says basically on it, Cheers Ernie, always, always with you, you are a star, lots of love from your Sacco girls. Oh, yeah, so they bought me that and had it engraved at Christmas, which if I told you how, how fantastic and brilliant everybody was at Leighton, you know, I couldn't have enough said about them, how good they were to me. But I am a fighter, I'll stand up to you every time, you're not going to win. They're a great, great team of girls. And the whole of the staff, Miss Knockhold, I, 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 there's that list that long. I, I got some little gifts at Christmas, I made them some hampers and bits and pieces and sent them through. And um, they, they they were very appreciated, but for them to do that for me, you know what I mean? They're, they're not supposed to, but, and they, when they give it me, they said, don't tell anybody, will you, Ernie? And I said, well, I won't say a word, girls. Not until I do my TV interview anyway, you know? <laughs> Ernie, you may have lost five and a half stone, but you've got a fantastic spirit, and we all need you back in that old star pub to welcome all your customers who are missing you so much. And we wish you the very best of luck with your health in the future. Now we're going to take a little break and we'll be back with you in a few minutes. Eurogold is driven by being the best civil engineering contractor in the Northwest, ensuring its clients are given the highest level of service that they deserve. Eurogold work in a wide range of industry sectors including house building, highways, commercial and industrial build. Lala Vita is an award winning independently run Italian restaurant. Located on Rose Lane in the heart of Liverpool, real Italian style dishes, using the best ingredients, skillfully prepared by our chefs. Come and try our serious Italian experience. Mulligan's Funeral and Monumental Services are a family owned funeral service, first established by the late Brian Mulligan in 1996. We provide funeral homes in Gorton, Manchester and Reddish, Stockport and we pride ourselves on giving a friendly and professional service to all the families who use our service. Contact us on 0161 
432-0809. Welcome back. Almost two years ago, Mark Tomlinson, who lived in Birmingham, sadly passed away. Mark was born with Down syndrome. Mark's death was a very traumatic time for all the family. This is the very first time that his parents have been able to speak to us on camera. We'll also be meeting some of Mark's friends. Mark was born in Solihull Hospital on an Easter Sunday, 1975. Uh, it was an easy birth. I felt so well I could have got up and come home with him. But I did ask the nurses why he was so floppy. And they said because he was premature. And it was a big shock then when we were asked to go into one of the rooms to meet the paediatrician. And she explained to us. And she said, Mark has a problem. He may not live long. And he may, but they don't usually live long, the children. So I came home here and I thought I was the only one in the world. I didn't know where to start. And we were asked to call to the doctors on the Warwick Road so they'd give me some tablets to relax me. I said, no, I don't need those. I'll have to try and cope. Anyway, Michael and my sister-in-law went to the doctor and the doctor said he didn't know anything about those children. So that made me a lot worse. I thought, oh dear, the doctors don't know. I came home here and my brother was here and he used to, him and his wife that he married, they used to look after Down syndrome while the mother went out and explained different things to me. Then I joined the community to all the coffee mornings, the different centres. And from then on, he was loved to bits. Mm. We were in Litchfield at a dinner dance with Liam and families. And on the Monday night, Tuesday then, when St. Patrick's Day, we went to Mass at Holy Souls. But on the Wednesday night, Mark took ill. We were up most of the night with him. And the next morning, he kept collapsing on me. Mm. Uh, he didn't want to drink or that, but I brought him down here and made him a mug of tea. And I was putting his stress and going on and he went down again. And I really thought he had gone. So I said to Mike, well, well I'll have to get the paramedics out. So that had been out a few times to Mark. And then again, he went in again with our daughter. She took him down to give us a break. And she had gone already gone from here in the, with the paramedics to Heartlands. And because she was working at a children's home, so they allowed her to go and put on the um, gear that they had to wear, you know, and all that. So, But she came back on the night with him and she took him to her house, but he didn't make much progress. And she said, Mum, I can't get him settled. So she rang them and she went in with him. But she'd sent him, um, FaceTimed us. Everything seemed fine on the FaceTime. He chatted away to us. He told me that he, I asked him, was he go by for the nurses? And he kind of said no, and I knew then why, because of the, the drip and that. And he, um, he wanted his brother up to say thank you for the magazines, the television magazines and that. So I said, well, you said you were a good boy, who are you a good boy for? He was a good boy for the priest. He blessed himself and said his prayers. And he kept insisting that he wanted his brother, which was very hard on us, because I said, he can't go, Mark. And then I stood in the kitchen thinking, well, people get well to leave us. Anyway, I thought that's wise, old wife's tale. Made the tea, came in, handed Mike the mug of tea, and the phone rang, saying he had passed away peacefully. Mm -hmm. And she was with him. And Michael, of course, it must have been a huge shock to find out that Mark had Down syndrome. But, you know, he grew up to be a beautiful boy and he was so much involved in the community. He was, yeah, very much involved. Yeah, he loved playing the music. He loved music. He loved playing the bower on. He'd uh, always bring it with him. If, even if we didn't know a band that was playing, he'd say, well, in case they need a bower on player. And Michael Collins, good man, him, to him, he's, he always would ask the band lad, he said, there's a bower on player down here, would you like to get him up and let him play a few tunes? I knew Mark 
socially, I suppose, more than anything else, because uh, I had been known to be uh, organising dances and concerts around Birmingham for a good few years, and Mark was always there to help me. And uh, he used to love doing the raffle or auction with me, and he, he was always there. He was my shadow. There's no doubt about it. And even up at Maryvale uh, for the past year or two of his life, he used to do the door for me. And he was never so happy as when he was on the door, um, checking their tickets coming in and, and all that. I run a few course trips and Mark, I think in all the trips I've organised over the past about 26 years, I think Mark and uh, Bridget only missed one. Uh, Mark always sat in the front seat with me and uh, he would never let anyone else sit on my seat. And uh, he'd always, uh, if anyone went to give out the sweets, that was my job to give out the sweets. And I can remember once when I hadn't come back and my wife took the sweet bag and handed them around. And my God, when I came back, he was giving out hell about Anne. How was that, that she took the sweets and that wasn't her job to do the sweets. So that was my job to do the sweets. M music was his life. Music was so much important to him. Uh, one of our members, Vince Jordan, actually taught him the Baron 30 years ago. And my God, he did a good job as well. After his passing, there was a lovely day at St Anne's in Birmingham where a lot of you guys and a lot of his friends come along to remember him in music. Yes, we did. Uh, there was quite a group got uh, together and they did a beautiful video of it. I am absolutely honoured to be invited to contribute to this online event, marking Mark's memory. Mark Tomlinson was a beloved son of Michael and Bridget and a very popular member of the Irish community in Birmingham. And while his untimely death caused great sadness, it is wonderful that we have this opportunity to celebrate his life and to mark his memory. Mark's tribute started off with Vince. He brought us together to do a tribute. Every week we'd have a meeting, ending up on the 18th of April with a recording. He'd get up with any band. And, and like uh, I think his dad said earlier on, no matter what band was playing, Mark made sure he brought the bow right. And Mark made sure he was up there playing with the lads. He, he loved it. As soon as he'd come into the hall, he'd make, a, he'd make his way to the bar and he'd even go around the bar and have a big hug from, from Trudy. She loved, she loved them. The room would light up when he, he'd, he'd enter the room. You know, he, he was that well-known and very popular little lad he was. He'll be sorely missed uh, by everybody because he was involved in every aspect of Irish life here. Um, with, down in St Anne's, any of the clubs in the church, uh, even in the choir he used to play, uh, the bower on up at the Holy Souls on a Sunday with Mike and, and uh, in the choir up there. Yeah, he'll be so, very, very sorely missed. Yeah. Angela, your other daughter, and your other son, Michael, was extremely good uh, to Mark as well. They were very close, weren't they? They were all very, very close. To all. Michael would come around here on a Sunday for dinner and Angela as well. And um, they were very close and loved them very much, yeah. After 18 months, there was a um, mighty weight lifted off our shoulders because we'd been waiting and waiting for the have the celebration mass for Mark. And afterwards, then we went had a reception in the Wesley Arms Hotel. It was a great lift, and to see everybody being able to come and join us, Michael's family, my family from Ireland, and that. And we were overwhelmed with when Mark passed away with the cards, the letters, and the phone calls. We couldn't believe that the people, people we didn't know, maybe with letters and everything that has been come to us. I felt really sad when I'd be up at the graves in Whitney Manor and then walk away and think that Mark was never brought to the church because of the lockdown and that. But everybody had said he had a lovely burial and the three priests stayed there in all the rain with, uh, with him. It's a shame that he passed away during the COVID and the lockdown because, you know, Birmingham would have been stopped for his uh, funeral that day only for such a lockdown. It would indeed, definitely. He would have, he would have taken pride of place uh, about, with that lockdown because um, 
the way things worked out uh, with COVID, it was such a shame, really. Uh, Mark uh, was always in the St. Patrick's Parade. He, he dressed up in the Birmingham Irish Pipe Band uniform and he played his bower on. More people knew Mark than Mike knew Mike and Bridget because he was known everywhere. You're right. He, after the St. Patrick's Day Parade, it would have been the biggest event in Birmingham, his, his funeral, had it been not COVID. I'm convinced of that. I saw this blonde wig on a window and I bought it and uh, gave it to Mark and uh, a recitation I do is uh, Michal Moore and uh, Mark played the part of Sixty Sue and he loved it and he put on the wig and he'd come out and he'd uh, have a, a dress or a, you know something on him and uh, he, he, he really played the part and he loved doing that. If you was here with us today and we're filming this what do you think he'd say to you? <laughs> no doubt about it, he would be taking the mickey out of me. <laughs> Everyone all around Birmingham knew Mark. He was such a lovely lad and he will be so sadly missed by all the community. May he rest in peace. Now that's the end of the show for this week. Just reminding you, Henry McGlade is back with us next Thursday evening at 7 o'clock with his show from County Mayo and we are here at half past seven with the Irish in the UK. Until then... See you next time.